This is the Ulu. This is a traditional Native American knife used by the Aleut, Inupiaq, and Inuit people. Traditional models of this knife were sometimes made out of slate, and in some places in northern Canada, the blade was actually made out of copper, the handle being bone or ivory, and passed down from generation to generation. In the last 150 years, the hardened steel of a carpenter's handsaw has replaced slate and copper as the blade material of choice. Not only is this knife perfect for skinning game or processing fish or scoring fish to dry, it's also just as much at home in the kitchen as a food processing knife for chopping vegetables and other foods that need to be chopped and processed. In this video, I'm going to take you through the step-by-step, -step, in depth, in detail process of making one of these ulus for yourself. I'm not only going to explain what materials are the best to use for this kind of a knife, but how to process those materials how to bond the handle to the blade, how to produce a nice razor sharp radius cutting edge without jeopardizing the temper of the steel. The steel that I use in Ulu's is from vintage handsaws. Those handsaws are already tempered, so I'm going to show you in this video how to process an Ulu blade out of an old saw blade without ruining the temper. Thank you so much for downloading this tutorial. I hope it covers everything that you want it to cover about the process of making an Ulu knife for yourself. At the end of this video, if there's anything that you feel I haven't covered, please feel free to contact me personally for any kind of a clarification. Now let's get right into it. How's it going everybody? We're working outside now on the stump bench out in the middle of the woods. Here of course is the Ulu that uh, we're going to use as our pattern. Let's walk through the material that you need to make this and how you go about roughing the shape out. Now this is what we're going to use for the blade material. We're going to use an old handsaw blade. When it comes to old handsaws, these distance from the turn of the century up until about the 40s for the Eskimos and the Aleuts and the Inuits, this was the go-to material. A old carpenter's handsaw. On these old handsaws like this, the steel has the same temper and heat treat all the way through the blade. So you could sharpen this saw a thousand times until there's nothing left and you're still dealing with the same type of steel. This particular saw is the Destin D8. Another thing that might be helpful is keep an eye out for brass hardware. After I believe it was 1940 they used a chrome hardware. The brass is the older saws which likely is going to have a better steel for this use. Now when looking for a handsaw to make an ulu out of, any one of these saws would do just fine. But the thing to remember is that these saws are fine old tools in and of themselves. And if one's in good shape and can be refurbished fairly easy and has a decent handle, it's probably not the best idea to go ahead and ruin it because it's probably worth more as a saw than it is as an ulu. You can see by these saws, they all share a few things in common. They all have brass hardware, and the handles are all fairly fine. I mean, these aren't great old handles, but they're very nice old handles. The newer the saw, the clunkier the handle's gonna get. Now, it's very easy to go to any flea market or a St. Vincent de Paul or a, or a Habitat for Humanity and find an old handsaw. What you wanna do, though, if you can, is find one that's bent or find one that has a busted handle or is damaged in some way. That way uh, you never have that on your conscience that you destroyed a good quality old saw. Okay, now this is the saw blade that we're gonna use. This is also from a distant. I would guess we can probably get six good ulus out of this one saw blade. What we need to do is make ourselves a pattern. Now to make a pattern, I'm just gonna use the ulu we already have in a paper plate. Take a Sharpie marker. That's about what we're looking for. Now, you can make your ulu any size, any shape you want. The basic idea is the same no matter what you'd like to see different about yours. I know I like a pattern about this size, about this shape, so that's just what we're gonna go with. Okay, now that we have our pattern, I think I'm just gonna go to the saw blade and I'm gonna mark out as many of these as we can get out of that particular blade. The one thing that you need to remember is we're actually gonna be breaking this metal. So when you mark your patterns out, just make sure you don't have two patterns that kinda of 
are kind of close to each other where you can't break one out without ruining the next pattern. All right. I think this would be a good place for the second ulu. If, uh, if we have this first one right here marked out and then we just only have that one single line to break, that kind of makes two lines with one break. You really should never cut this metal. Any kind of a cutoff wheel like a handheld angle grinder, it's probably going to be a little too hot and it might burn the edge and lose the temper out of the blades. And you definitely don't want that. Could get one right here. Now once again, we have one pattern here. We'll just share that same line so that when we break our metal, we're breaking just one line and kind of getting two lines out of it. Now, well there's four patterns. I think this last one is just going to have to be just a touch smaller. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the top edge of the saw as one of the edges of the, the pattern. Make one line here and then I'll just kind of kind of freehand this last one and it's going to be a little bit smaller. We'll go all the way down to the teeth. This little tip here is just a little bit too small to get another pattern out of. All right, well this is the part where I tell you uh, I'm not responsible if you get a chunk of metal in your eye. I'm not responsible if you cut yourself. This is just for entertainment purposes, whatever the lawyers need to see. The fact of the matter is what we're going to be doing is we're going to be fracturing that metal with a hammer, placing the metal in a vise and snapping it. I've never had a problem with this. I've never been hit with a flying chunk. It's very easy to do, but on the other hand, we're working with brittle metal and hammers and I just want you to know this is the disclaimer portion of this video. All right, now let's go ahead and we'll cut the first one out by breaking it out. Okay, these will be the definitely the hardest cuts of the whole project. We want to get this blade in half so it's easier to work with. This first break is going to be the most challenging break of the whole project. That line drawing, when we put our patterns on there, we're going to put that line nice and flush with the top of the vise and then lock it down. Make sure to lock down the base of the vise too. Now what I'm doing here is I'm just flexing the blade and I'm going to work right along the base just by tapping that very edge with any kind of hammer. Don't forget your safety glasses on this one. A little bit of pressure flexing that blade. Oh, that's a bad deal. That first break is the most challenging break and I've already lost an ulu because I broke beyond what I was supposed to. This, uh, this ulu blade here should come out to about here. That's just the way it is. Let's go ahead and take that piece off. Now what's to be done about flying chunks of steel? Good question. One thing you can do is you can take a t-shirt or any like a towel or something and put it over top of the work that you're working with. It's going to ruin the t-shirt. It's going to ruin the towel because you're pounding two pieces of metal with that buffer between it. But it keeps anything that breaks from flying off. This one's going to be difficult because the break needs to be longer than what the vise is. So we're kind of going to have to go a little slow. A little bit of pressure. Oops. And if you take a look at our fracture on this one, uh, we're kind of getting just outside our pattern. This pattern is a little bit oversized. This is going to work, but still, breaking these big pieces apart, this is where it's really tricky. A little bit of back pressure with your hand. Now, you should wear gloves for this. I don't wear gloves for anything, which is my own stupidity, but this is probably something you should wear gloves with. We're going to finish that break now. Strike it right at the very bottom. Just like that, pops right off. 
Now those are definitely the harder breaks to make when you have a big piece that you're trying to crack all the way across to get two smaller pieces. Once you have a smaller piece and you're just roughing in the shape, much easier to make the breaks. Let me show you what it looks like to take and make a break with a t-shirt or a towel over top of it so uh, so you don't have any flying metal because once you're starting to get into some smaller pieces you know you could bust one off and you're not going to be using your hand to put pressure on it you're just going to be hitting the chip and it's going to fly so let me show you how to take care of that okay what we're going to do we're going to take this pattern we're going to break off this extra area and then we're going to start breaking off this round shape probably two or three breaks at a time look who showed up that's right what we're going to do here is I think I will break off the radius area first and that should give us enough clearance that we can fit this in and break off the teeth. By clearance I mean this. There's only just so much room between the main base of this vise and the top of the teeth. So anything you stick in there has got to, it's got to be short enough that it can get down to where the line is. Now we have a piece in there and it's clamped pretty close to the line. We're just going to take an old t-shirt, drape it right over the whole vise. Right there's your piece you're breaking. Just like that. Broke it right off. Another little nub here should probably go. Let's scooch that over just so we can get as much as we can. Now there's not much protruding here. So it's definitely going to break easy. That's probably going to want to fly. And cover it up. Right here's our metal. We've got half of our radius broke out. Let's get this other half broke out. Now we, we're probably going to have to take a couple three shots at this to get all the biggest stuff broke off. Want to make sure you're right to the very outside edge of where the line is. Really, you can't see any line, but the line's just underneath the edge right here. That way you're not getting too far into the blank. There's a couple more little pieces here. I'll just give them each a little tap. This should be about the end of cutting that radius out. Now that edge is really rough, but a file is going to make short work of that. If you have a wet grinder, you can use a wet grinder too, but I would stay away from a bench grinder. It's a very thin piece of steel, and I don't think it takes much of anything to lose its temper. So, belt sanders, water, that's probably okay, especially for dialing in the sides. Up here, anything goes. You can use anything you want. But along the edge, I'd probably stick with a file if I were you. All we've got left to do is take off this last chunk. About like that-ish. And then... There's a couple pieces I'll have to go pick up over here. And I better do that right now before I forget where they are. And we're going to say that that blank is pretty much cut out. Now I'm going to knock out these next four or five. And then we'll move on to our next phase of the project. When I'm done, I'll probably come out here with my roller magnet. Make sure I got all these bits and pieces. T-shirt method's really good, especially if you're indoors. If you're indoors and you're busting this stuff, usually your vice is on a bench, it's against the wall. 
you break these pieces off, they bounce off the wall. And there's where they actually have a chance to come back at you. Out here, they're just gonna go the other way. In a shop, you know, they can bounce anywhere you want. T-shirt's a really good idea. This is kind of its own little world. I can't really think of anything else you do where you're fracturing hardened metal. A little bit more on this guy and it's pretty much good. There we go. So there it is. But we've got our five Ulu blanks all broken out. And they're all ready to be made into a fully functional Ulu. Just like the one here that's already done. Let's pick one of our Ulu blanks and we're going to take that blank from where we have it right now until a completed Ulu. Right now I'm going to take a file and knock all those nasty spots off there and make a nice smooth radius. The round cutting edge of the Ulu, I'm going to do it all by hand. I think that this is the blank that we're going to use for the rest of this project. Those edges are pretty jagged. Lots of little nasty spots. There's one corner here I'll probably tap off with a hammer. If there's anything left that's, you know, substantial, you can always tap that off. But I'm going to try it with a large cold chisel. Just should be able to put all that force right where we want it. Might be a little bit better way to do it. Huh. Works like a charm. All right, now I've got my cutting edge right here. I'm gonna chuck that in the vise, edge up, kind of more off towards my side. Now, as you probably figured out already, I'm not a big OSHA guy, but this is one thing I do like to wear gloves for. It's like sharpening trowels or anything like that where you're working a file right along the edge. This is something that we should have good hand protection for. Clean out your best file so it's ready to rock, and then, just work that edge. Ooh, see? Yeah, that would have cut me. Now standing over top of it like this, you can put a lot of downward pressure. Just try to, try to watch where your hands go. Even with a good set of gloves, you never know working like this. Believe it or not, we're almost there. Let's just take a real close peak. We've got a nice clean edge all the way to about right this section here. I'll just clean this area up and then kind of eyeball it just its shape and then this should be about where we want it. You're, as you're filing you're, you're watching those little divots disappear and you know you're right there. Right about where you need to be. That's about it. Now the part of rounding the blade that really matters, if there's any kind of little divots out of the side, you want to make sure they don't go to the center. The center line is going to stay right about where it's at because we're going to bevel both sides. So that looks, that's about right. Uh, oh man, we're, we're right there. And as soon as that looks right to the eye, I'm going to say it is right. That's about it. I think that radius right now is just about as good as I could get it. We're gonna call that good. Now what about putting an edge on this blade? We'd like to have this clamped flat so we can file it. So what we're gonna do here, I'm gonna take this blade and I'm gonna screw it down tight to the top of this stump. In order to do that, I brought out a couple heavy washers and a couple screws. Place the washer over top of the Ulu blank and screw it down. Now this blank is attached to this stump nice and solid and we're going to be just working this very edge. But this is definitely the time to wear a set of gloves.
Nice. That's about it for that edge. All I do here is just loosen those screws up a little. I should be able to take this guy right out. And put it right back in the other way. That's about it. And that's how you take an ulu blank and finish it by hand with just files and, and a vise. So let's make the assumption that you don't have a tree stump handy. Now this little jig here is just about perfect for working on a wooden bench top. I've got three screws that are holding it to the bench itself. On top of that, I've got two just plain sheetrock screws and like one inch washers. Now I can take my ulu blank and hold it down with these two washers and screws and then I've got this rounded wooden surface that supports the whole area of this blade so that I can file it into shape. Now one problem with this jig once these washers pinch this blank, it tends to kind of lift this front edge up. So just putting a piece of scrap metal that's about the same thickness as the ulu blank underneath the back side of these washers, it keeps from pinching that ulu and lifting it up. It's more even pressure down. Let's take these washers and screws and get them good and tight. And that blank is nice and solid to be filed. Just like when we're filing out in the woods, no different in here. Good heavy gloves are the rule of the day because we're actually clamping down something that's going to be super sharp and forcing a file into the face of it. One slip like that barehanded and you could really, really hurt yourself. Now this radiused block of wood here, uh, it, it's not exactly right for every ulu blade because each ulu blade is different. But what it does do is it supports this radius better than the flat edge of a bench wood. It gives a little more uniform support for this blade. I usually try to get to where I feel is about halfway and then Flip the whole thing over. Oh. See a slip like that? Without a set of gloves, I could have run my hand into the corner. <laughs> Very bad. Now what I do is I'm filing until I just start to see that little bit of a burr on the edge. That lets me know that I've made it to the center, that both sides have a bevel that comes to a fine point. As soon as that little bit of a, a wire edge starts to appear, that little bit of frayed area along the edge, I know that this blade is, is filed enough and I can do the fine sharpening at once the is actually finished. I can start to see that edge showing up in the middle, so I know that that middle is probably good enough. Couple more strokes just for good measure. And make sure these corners are good too. Now I think that edge is about right. What I generally do is I put my fingers underneath of it and I feel for a wire edge all the way along the full length of this blade. When I feel that wire edge all the way along that blade, I know that that bevel is complete on both sides and it comes to a fine point. I'll knock that wire edge off once the ulu is complete. This way I know that all the filing is done. All I have to do is a little bit of fine work, honing the very edge of that blade, and uh, this bevel is good. Now this ulu blade is about ready for a handle. You can see these holes were actually where the old handle grip was bolted to the saw blade originally. There's actually the pattern of the handle grip where it hasn't rusted. But I want to make sure that any kind of corrosion, anything that's loose, anything that might inhibit the epoxy from bonding these, bonding the handle to the 
the steel. I want to make sure that's all cleaned up. I may even take a second and go over the patina of the saw blade because all these old saw blades have a little bit of surface rust. I make sure I clean up anything that would be easier to clean up right now. This blank is pretty much ready for a handle. You won't even see these holes because the handle's big enough it covers that entire area. Now before this blank is ready for a handle, we're gonna need to take a little bit of acetone and make sure any any kind of dust or anything of that nature is off the blade. Just a little bit is all you need. Don't get it on your fingers, keep it on the rag. Stuff will evaporate nearly instantly. It cleans that metal right off, any kind of dust, or any kind of oils or anything. Acetone is the bomb, just uh, keep it off your fingers or of course wear a pair of rubber gloves. You'll feel acetone immediately when it touches your skin because it'll be almost ice cold just because it evaporates so fast. Just the physics of it feels freezing cold. When it comes to handle materials, anything that's a good hardwood that's dry should work just as good as the next thing. So let's get on into the barn and we'll take a look and see what we have available and that's what we'll use. Oh, there's a nice piece of walnut. That's about the right thickness too. I think we found our board. There's a nice piece of cherry. Ah, I really like the look of the cherry, but the walnut is about the right thickness. So all I've got to do is take passes off the side. I think I'm gonna go with the walnut. Yeah, that's the beauty of the board. It's about the right thickness. So I don't have to make two different cuts. I'll just be able to slab this thing off. I love it. Now I'm gonna make these knife handles probably about 3 8 on both sides. I'm gonna need a little extra meat on the handles in order that they can be sanded down into the final shape. So I'm gonna go about a half an inch. That's about a half an inch gap and that should do me just about right. Some of these pieces turned out with a beautiful multicolored grain where you can see the heartwood and sapwood. That's gonna look awesome. I wanna to try to get as many ulus out of these sticks as I possibly can. So this is what I'm gonna do. So I'm just gonna lay this guy down. I need to make sure that there's enough wood that protrudes past this corner because I don't want it to, I don't want there to be a missing corner here. If I just take and mark both sides like so and I can just flip it over the other way. I want to make sure I leave just a little bit of a gap Because you know, there's gonna be a saw kerf there, but not only that I want a little bit to sand doesn't have to be a bunch, but just a little bit that way I'm I'm not short This works out about perfect one two three four five six perfect seeing as how these are just straight cuts I could cut these with a handsaw I could cut them with a chop saw. I'm gonna cut these with a band saw, just cause that's handy. My band saw is a piece of junk. Just think of how well that would have went on a good band saw. Now on this particular ulu that I made for Brooke for Christmas, all I used was two part epoxy to hold the handle on. I have absolutely no worries about this handle ever coming off. Okay, let's take a look at putting one of these ulus together and my favorite way to, to make sure everything goes together and lines up. First of all, I take my ulu blank then I take the handle pieces that I've cut out, make sure that they fit roughly. 
Now they don't have to fit perfect, they just have to be in the ballpark, because I'm going to do all the final shaping after the fact. You can see this vise I got here on the desk. Uh, this vise is, it's, of course, it's out of the garage. It's been out on the stump out in the woods. But by using a vise as a clamp, it gives me a chance to adjust the blade up and down while the scales are kind of, the scales are kind of kept exactly where they are by the jaws of the vise, and then I can move the blade up or down to make sure everything is lined up. See, when I clamp a set of handles in this vise with the blade, I can get the bottom of the handles all lined up about right, and then if, uh, if the blade needs to get moved, I can actually move the blade up or down or side to side while the handles stay put. This is probably the best way to clamp one of these handles, because literally you're dealing with two pieces of wood and one piece of metal, and once you have epoxy over all those surfaces, it's just like everything's greased. In order to hold it in place for that five minutes it takes to set, this is a good method. I got a bunch of these little sticks. They're cut out from a paint stir stick. They're just a little hardwood stick. I use these for mixing epoxy. I'll mix up one batch of epoxy and use it. Then I kind of turn my plate so I got a clean spot to work. And I grab a new stick. About that much. Something about that size. About, about as big as a quarter or a little bigger. That's about right for putting a set of scales on. And then I'll take and give it a good mixing. And once that epoxy is good and mixed up, I'll take a handle and apply the epoxy to it. Making sure I get all the surfaces covered. And check for dry spots when you're done too. You don't want any air bubbles in there. And anywhere that the, the wood isn't covered, you know, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a void when you put it to the metal. So just keep an eye out for dry spots when you're applying your epoxy to your wood. Once that's all good, I will stick it on my ulu blank. Set that ulu blank aside. And I'll coat the other side of the handle. I'm actually in the process right now of making uh, about 20 of these. Uh, everybody from my wife's YouTube channel seemed to be interested in them. So I've decided to do a run of 20. And I'm shooting this video as I'm making 20 ulus, which has taken me all stinking week. But I enjoy the work. Okay, so let's say that's about right. I take the ulu, I stick the other handle onto the ulu. A little bit of a squeeze, set it aside. Now right about now is the time when I can take the first ulu out. This is five minute, two part epoxy. I'll set that ulu aside. I'll take the new ulu that's freshly epoxied. I'm gonna set it in the jaws of this vise, lining the handles up as best I can to start with. Not worried about the blade as much, just the handles. What I will do at this point is I will adjust, I'll adjust the handles in the vise just a little bit. Now I'm actually sighting down the wood. I sight right straight down the wood and I make sure the bottom is flush one side to the next. I don't really care so much about the top because the top is going to get sanded completely flat. But the bottom's got to be the same, because it's not going to get worked once this is set. And then I take the metal at that point, and I center it the best I can, and I leave it. Now at this point, what I do is I pick out my next ulu blank, the steel portion. I grab a set of handles that fit that steel portion about right, because honestly, no two of these are exactly the same. So I pick the handle scales that actually fit that particular steel the best. And then I'll epoxy those scales up, mix up a fresh batch of epoxy, put the scales on. By that time, I can take the one out of the vise that we just put in. It's about a 10 minute turnaround, 
But that gives me uh, plenty of time to do an ulu and get it ready while the other one is setting up. But as opposed to any specific kind of clamp, uh, this vise is the best I've found. Because it's solid, even though it's not screwed down to the top of my desk, it's heavy enough, it just sits there. And when the jaws come together, they can't move. You know, like a C-clamp, it's got a kind of a swivel to the threaded portion of the C-clamp. It can move around a little bit. The jaws of this vise don't move at all. I actually use a little bit of carpet tape on the inside of the jaws and then put a pad of leather. That leather grabs the two sides of the handle scales and then you can tip the scales to make them line up or slide them a little bit before you really clamp the pressure on. And that way the handles stay true and then just take that blade and adjust it to where it's as lined up as it needs to be. Once this epoxy cures for 24 hours, we'll go back outside, do all the final shaping, and once everything is completely final shaped, then we're, we're pretty much ready to put on an epoxy finish, and the ulu is done. Now we've come to the part where we have both of our handles epoxied to our blank. Now this this two-part epoxy, now this provides a real nice tight bond for this handle. It should never come off. The reason why I attach the handle this way is because drilling this blank is, is very hard to drill hardened steel like this. And I definitely don't want to anneal this metal and then reheat treat it. And that's why I don't bother drilling out holes or annealing the blade. I, I want to keep the original saw's temper and heat treat because it's, it's good and hard, and it's meant to be sharpened. Old saw blades, like this ulu is made out of, they were meant to last a lifetime. They were meant to be sharpened again and again and again until there was no metal remaining. That's why these old 100-year-old saws are still around. It takes an immense amount of work to ever wear one out. It's probably ultimately the reason why a lot of those old saw companies went out of business. You buy one saw and 100 years later, it's still a pretty good saw. The next step in this process is I'm gonna fire up the belt sander outdoors with some breathing protection because we are gonna be sanding cured epoxy. I'm not only gonna make these ends nice and true and clean them up, I'm also gonna chamfer the hard edges. I'm gonna final sand the sides of the scales. I'm gonna sand this top section down nice and true. And once this ulu is all sanded up, then I'm gonna go ahead and coat it with a final coat of two-part epoxy. Let's sand it up. Of course, I can take and final sand this a little bit with some hand sanding. Get these corners rounded off a little nicer. You can also see that I've removed enough material that we're nice and flush along the top. We're nice and flush along the sides. As far as I'm concerned, I think this ulu is ready for some final epoxy. And once it's set, I'll touch up that edge to make sure that any wire edge on the cutting edge itself has been removed. And then this ulu will be ready to go. What we're gonna do is mix up some more two-part epoxy, just whatever you can find the five-minute epoxy in a hardware store. And we're gonna coat this handle to seal it away from 
you know, dishwashing liquid and water and whatever else that would get into the wood. I'm going to put a pretty good healthy puddle of this. That should probably do it. I'll stir this up with, uh, in this case, a kitchen match. Just something disposable. Now this being a five minute epoxy, we don't have a ton of time to work with this. We're going to want to be fairly quick with it. As soon as we got her mixed up good, we need to brush it on. Take the match that I used, wipe that excess on there. We've got a little disposable paintbrush. The, the thing to remember here is just it needs to get on fairly quickly and try to get it on as even as you can. But you know, good good thick application of it. Because after all, you know, this is going to this is going to protect the the wood for the lifetime of this tool. Don't forget the end grain on the end of the handle. It's got to be all good and filled in. Honestly, you don't need a ton of time. You just need to get it on there and then smooth it out as best you can. And it'll lay down. It'll lay down nice and flat like a paint. It's also good to make sure you get right along this line. Just take a little extra time. Make sure your epoxy is completely filling that joint where the wood meets the blade along the bottom edge. I think I'll just take the next minute here and kind of even this coat out. You could probably do this with like a helmsman or another kind of a really thick urethane. I'm just using two-part epoxy because it's what I have. Being that the joint of this handle to the blade is an epoxy joint and there are no pins in this handle, we definitely want to make sure we do a good job totally sealing this ulu up. You know, you're going to need to wash this, of course. It's going to probably get, somebody's going to probably throw it in the dishwasher or washing it by hand. You give that ulu handle just a few minutes and that, that epoxy will lay down. I think that ulu turned out pretty good. As soon as that's dried, I'll give a final touch up to this. <laughs> now, I, I keep bumping the handle with my hands and then getting epoxy on the blade. So I think I'm going to go find a place to set this down. And as soon as it dries, I'll clean up anything that's left on the blade, maybe with a little acetone. And then we will uh, put a final sharpening on it, and it'll be ready to go. What I like to do is I'll take a drawer, and I'll just slip the blade of the ulu into the bottom of the drawer and leave it. That way it can hang on to the blade, the handle's nice and free, it's not going to bump anything. And that's a good place to put one of these ulus so that your epoxy on the handle, or whatever finish you use, has a chance to dry. Now we're down to the final step in the ulu making process. I have to take these ulus that I've made and just knock the wire edge off the very edge of the cutting surface. In order to get this nice cutting edge on each one of these without losing the temper, every one of these ulus is filed by hand. That leaves a little bit of a wire edge burr on them. What I'll generally do to fix that is I'll take a hand file and as opposed to the angle that the blade is on, I'll give it just a little bit more tip and lightly take that wire edge right off. Sometimes you gotta go both sides, make a couple passes very lightly. That's it. I've removed that wire edge. Now this blade is very sharp. But I wanna leave that wire edge on until I'm done processing these ulus because I don't wanna be dealing with a razor sharp ulu. Once that wire edge is gone, that blade's sharp. This is our sweet Ulu right here. My favorite one of the batch. This was made right out of the center of the saw blade and it's got that cool Distin D8 logo right in the middle of it. And there you have it. 
the entire process from start to finish of how to go about making a Native American Ulu knife. I hope this video has been informative. I hope it's been everything you expected it to be. And I hope that you enjoy your Ulu knife for years and years to come. My name's Dave Whipple, and this has been a Bush Radical production. Thank you much, and we'll see you soon.